So, hello, Peter. It's great seeing you. you Hi, Joanna. <laughs> you in Excellent. Hamburg, me in Helsinki. <laughs> yes, HH, Northern Europe, but it seems we have a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I look forward to our interview. And the topic is uh, creativity. And uh, before we uh, get into the topic, I'd like to um, ask you who you are and what do you do? Okay, so my name is Peter Ivanov. Um, I'm currently a keynote speaker, so I speak on big events and I love it. And I also uh, coach teams particularly, but also their managers and particularly teams which are dispersed, so-called virtual teams or remote teams or distributed teams. This is my passion. And my brand is called Virtual Power Teams. And I help people in different locations, you know, to get together, to feel the strong team spirit, strong team unity, and they can tackle any challenge. So far, I'm challenging, I'm, I'm tackling together with those team business challenges to get productivity, to have more turnover, reduce cost, and so on. But I work also with NGOs, which want a better world. So mm -hmm. I would like to even tackle the toughest uh, challenges of humanity by building virtual power teams. I think if we have a clear vision and get together, there is no challenge that could resist us. That's wonderful. I love your passion. And, and I think it's very much needed in today's world, which becomes very virtual and digital. And it has these great benefits that we can work together. But what you do, it also has this, like, it actually helps people connect, if I understand right. Yes, yes. So it's all about yeah. connecting people heart to heart. And that's one of the first mistakes. People say in a virtual teams, I don't see the people, normally the, often the managers say, why should I bother what are they as individuals? And this is what we address first. They present themselves, I do it with a lifeline, with a, some special moderation, but you know, five to ten minutes, they go through their moments of excellence, they're most proud of, they are the happiest, but also the moments where it's more difficult. And every one of us has such moments. Yeah. And when people listen to each other and see from them presenting this, within five to ten minutes, they find what makes the heart of each and everyone sing. And this is very powerful. That's how we see this connection, this interpersonal relationships, and later on, we nurture it. And that's the foundation for the power team. I mean, we create this trust that we nurture later on. That's absolutely lovely, what uh, the kind of power team that, that you contribute to. And uh, Peter, I would like to ask you now, considering this, this wonderful work that you do, uh, if you think about everything you have achieved today, what would you say that are your top three skills that enable you to have what you have now? Okay. So, by the way, I'm a five-year keynote speaker and, and team coach, as I said, an executive. Before that, I was 20 years IT manager, including senior IT manager. I was leading for Europe uh, the project delivery unit, like 30 project managers delivering the whole IT project portfolio for Europe for a big multinational. And the last three years, I was running head of IT services for EMEA, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So I had my own virtual teams to run, sometime 100 plus permanent people plus equal number of contractors. Uh, and I had my, uh, I did a few mistakes, uh, which hopefully I learned from, so it was not always rosy. But uh, top three skills, I think one, first one comes from my corporate past. When I, um, I learned to lead from distance by practicing by making mistakes for sure i had some good mentors but the best mentor is yourself and the experience in the real life and um, to some extent there as a manager um, you have to you have to kill your ego kill is a bit strong but initially and today we'll talk about creativity you know you're a creative person you have a vision and everything so you tend to think you know you know it better yeah. <laughs> but in fact in order to be successful as a leader you have to pull back and be able to listen be able to encourage and nurture formats where people can brainstorm and the vision and the goals emerge from the team it's not that you inspire them with your own vision and goals there are moments you need to do that but the bigger part is co-creation so i think my big lessons for corporate life was you know controlling my ego and giving the others the space 
and the stage and encouraging them and nurturing them. Wow. And for sure in the corporate life, you have to uh, learn politics, but in a good way, because mm -hmm. multinationals are famous for politics and everybody is looking for career yeah. and everything. But there you need to be also be able to see in the stakeholder mix the people you work with, including your team, but your peers, your boss, his boss, and so on. How could you position yourself? How could you position the vision that you create as a team? How to articulate the benefits that you create and the value for these stakeholders? What is in for them? And if you do that uh, genuinely, not to manipulate, but you know, to create value for your team and for their purpose and their team, you could be successful. So that was the first lesson, killing the ego and understanding the others. Um, second one is probably my last five years as a, um, as a speaker and a standalone entrepreneur. Um, I think there you have to believe in yourself, mm -hmm. especially the first years. And it sounds like easy. Um, I mean, it is simple. You have to believe in your capability. Um, and uh, often it is, um, you know, as an entrepreneur first year, you cannot just focus on your strengths. You have to do everything. Even if you're a spoiled senior manager and you had an assistant and everything, now you start from scratch, you have to do everything. So yeah. you start to appreciate the value that some other people's delivered to you. You start to sort out what I'm really good at and to spend more time and for the other, try to maybe find someone else or be patient with yourself. Um, and believe that you will succeed in the end because it's not easy. For example, as a senior manager, I never had to do sales. I mean, you have to sell your concepts, as I said, to the stakeholders, yeah. but never really close a deal with financials and so on. It was difficult for me. Yeah. But believing in the value, you know, you step in, you learn, you be patient, and, and that's how uh, it all kind of developed. So, yeah, the second lesson is about believing yourself, appreciating, knowing your strengths, working more there, but also um, appreciating the value that some other people deliver for you. And if they're not there, <laughs> you do it yourself. Yeah. Um, and the third one, probably, which links to our interview is... Um, nurture your creativity uh, and uh, in my boss in my uh, <clears throat> in my role as a senior IT manager I probably didn't have the opportunity to be as creative as I wish to and as I think I have it in me mm -hmm. because it's a corporate environment you have to some extent set goals yeah. as a team you could you know put your team agenda you could be creative but it's limited and now as an entrepreneur and a speaker with my own topic as a book author, you know, I have the creativity fully unleashed, so I can do everything I can imagine, and I think it would deliver best value for, for the audience and for the people. Um, so um, I was uh, kind of streamlining my creative process. We could go in detail later more, also related to, to my book. Uh, which is now translated in five languages and Chinese is the sixth uh, coming this year. So, um, okay. yeah, really how to nurture your creativity, how to uh, be good to yourself. So if you have it, you could really take best advantage of it. Yeah. I, I love um, this insight, these three major insights, kill your ego and, and believe in, in, in your in the value as that you want to to give to clients and then nurture creativity i mm -hmm. i uh, love them and i i um, i'm a bit um, biased because i relate to them mm -hmm. and um yeah since we are now at this point where we mentioned the word creativity i would like to ask you um, what is creativity to you mm -hmm. creativity is uh, for me emerging with something new um, so it is emerging a concept an idea which has not been there before mm -hmm. so it may be modification of some existing concepts that you had and maybe a combination of something that you had in mind and maybe combining by some influences that yeah. you've read sometimes even a long time ago and you've forgotten but then combining it in a new way and then coming up with uh, with a new concept. Yeah. 
Uh, and this is a fascinating process. And this is probably what distinguishes us human beings from even more smarter learning machines, because we could really, you know, create something completely new. And you may bring it to spirituality, you know, where it is coming from, uh, but it's another question. But apparently we have the capability of imagining something completely new and then specifying the until it becomes something tangible that could inspire other people. Yeah. And if, if you think of yourself, let's say, on a scale from zero to 10, how creative would you say that you are? I think I'm about eight, which is a high ranking. I'm critical. But uh, honestly speaking, when I was uh, considering doing something different after 20 years multinational management, um, I did a, a test. Uh, somebody told me about a book called Strengths Finder 2.0 by Gallup, yeah. perhaps you know it. Yeah. So, and she said, I did the book, I did the action plan, and then I changed my job. It was a lady who shared with me. So oh, that sounds interesting, let's do that. <laughs> so I did it, and then my top number one strength, for my surprise, was they call it input. But input is what they mean is creativity. You yeah. can come up with new ideas. So yeah. you never run out of ideas. You yeah. can always, sometimes even it's too much out of the box and it's crap. It's not productive at all, but you generate a lot of ideas, and that's me. So I started to appreciate and look at me from different perspective. And, um, and once I knew I can, and that, then I figured it out that, in fact, in the past, I never, I never had problem with creativity. I always had a lot of ideas. I was wondering which one to pursue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even too much in the team, and there were some critical people for good reason that say, you know, that's not pragmatic, that's, that wouldn't work, it's nice, sound nice. But once I knew that my top strength is input and creativity, yeah. I just started to ride on this wave. And then my book appeared, I never imagined to be a book author. But then I can tell you how the idea was created. And now I'm even Amazon top three international management best-selling author. I was only for a week, but nevertheless, I was top three. <laughs> there. Congratulations. Yes. Uh, yes. So it's, it's all started with this uh, kind of um, realization that actually creativity is my strength. And it came from external uh, source. But once you believe it, once you made it believable, because you check your past and you see that's this, you yeah. could create a lot more energy and then it becomes a real strength. Yes. Mm. So wonderful. I, 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 love, I love this story also, how, how uh, empowered you became after, after doing the st uh, strength test. Mm -hmm. And if, if we think about um, all the activities that you do as an entrepreneur, what would you say that the are the activities where your cr creativity is mostly needed? <laughs> um. It is, I, this is how I start the day. By the way, for me, timing is also uh, important. I'm an early bird, so I wake up early without any clock, alarm, or so on. And this is where I dedicate my energy. The first, you know, one, two hours is about conceptualizing. Mm -hmm. Normally, maybe the day before in my weekly plan, I will know what is coming up. Is it my now new online course? or a new blog, mm -hmm. or even how to approach a new partnership in terms yeah. of, again, what is win for each party and how could we sustain it. Mm -hmm. But all these things I would do early in the morning and I would also use some visuals and uh, conceptualize it. So as an entrepreneur, you create your brand, you create your product, you create the value mm -hmm. which you give. And I say you create, it's not just you. I mean, it starts with me because I'm a bit introvert. I need to start, channel all this ideas, energy, visualize it, and then I, um, then I get feedback. Then I start sharing, get feedback, and improve it. Particularly if it's about value, you need to bounce it with your customers. Otherwise, you may be completely wrong. Yeah. But uh, it is very important because uh, you enter the market and you design your products from scratch. Yeah. So it is a creative process, yeah. but it should not be standalone. It should not be like fail fast Google. I mean, it should be, if you are not on the right track and you miss the market and the market response is not so positive, you have to stop early enough. That's the Google fail fast principle. And most of the startups adopt it and then change, look at another creative angle and 
you know, adapt it. So it's finally you meet a real market need and you fit it in a, you meet it with a good, good product yeah. or service. <clears throat> And um, you, um, if, if you think about creativity, is is actually also like um, basically a set of skills. It, it it starts with being very motivated to do what you are doing. This inner motivation. It mm -hmm. continues with what you are mentioning, visualizing or having imaginative skills. And then the creative process is starting when when you when you you want to gather information on your vision um, then you move on to inspiration and then uh, to the actual implementation so what would you say so considering all these creativity skills what would you say that is your strength in particular probably my is really generating new ideas uh, that's my strength and I apply it also um, once you build the idea as an entrepreneur, then you have to market it. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you have a target group, you know, the, the more concise, the better. In my case, target group is also diverse. So you have to put the right messages which really resonate yeah. with your target group. So it's yeah. part of the implementation, but also how do you market your idea? But I think my biggest strength is really coming up with new concepts and then making it marketable. So seeing from the other person point of view from your you know uh, client point of view that's a bit of design thinking kind of mindset and then come up with the right messages which would appeal yeah. because in the current marketplace with so much offering mm -hmm. to some extent it's a marketing battle i mean for yeah. sure you have to have a quality product otherwise there will be no recurring customers yeah. but uh, the first battle and the decisive is to get to yeah. speak to your target group to get known so yeah. they can understand the value you offer and they can test your product. Yeah. And in terms of implementation and so on, there sometimes I need help, but I know that and I'm mobilizing a virtual team when it comes to, you know, uh, maybe making videos or anything needed in order to market your product and then hit the market. Wonderful. And um, now we are entering actually the second part of the interview. When we talked in the beginning, I, I told you that we have three parts. So in the first part was your, your relationship with your creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, what I hear is that you are an ideator. I, ideator, yes, I'm generating ideas. You, you, you are very natural generating ideas in all the activities. <laughs> Can I add one more thing? Yes, please. And I appreciate your structure. I like the structures of three parts, very logical. <laughs> Maybe one thing to my relationship to creativity. It is very critical and I've learned it also the hard way or uh, I've done it, I've done a mistake. When you start creating, for example, writing your blog or writing your book, when you generate the ideas, you shouldn't criticize at all. I mean, you should be just letting the ideas flow they may be completely bullshit not it down step further so and this is very important when i read the book i mean initially you read two paragraphs and then you start reading from the first and then you activate completely different part of your brain it's scientifically proven and you start the critical mind and you get lost and you forgot so and in the end productivity is much lower while you are in the ideation process, just keep going, keep flying, and then switch off, change hat, and criticize. And this apply also. I said I'm introvert. Currently, I ideate my ideas myself, and then I, you know, discuss and get feedback. But sometimes startups very popular. You create the ideas as a team, and I do it with with the teams, the virtual teams that I coach. So it is very critical also to avoid any criticism. Put it as a norm. Observe it as a moderator. There is a beautiful format, which is somebody says an idea and the other says, yes, and yes. you are not allowed to say, but which yes. comes the critical yes with enthusiasm yes. and and you build upon and our imagination, each one of us will come something to build upon. And when I do this with the teams or even with the students, within like three, five rounds with this yes, and you come with completely new concept, which is much more robust and, and beautiful and inspiring to people. So the relationship, just bear in mind, if you do ideation, don't be critical as yeah. a single person or as one. And if it's a team, this is this fault tolerance culture. It is a culture that has to be established, take a few iterations, but then the payback is immense. 
Yeah, thanks for, for um, bringing this great aspect into light, like um, not to be judgmental when you are generating ideas. Yes. Um, we will get a bit uh, later also to more details about your own ideation process, but I am, um, you know, it, it's, it's a very crucial aspect that you just mentioned now. Uh, and it's also like it, it re revolves to generating ideas in, in different contexts, but especially in writing a book. and. Um, mm -hmm. And speaking about this writing the book, uh, I would like to ask you, because you mentioned that you didn't consider yourself like um, ever writing a book, what uh, motivated you to, to do that or what inspired you to do that? In fact, it is, it is um, funny, as many things in life. <clears throat> Initially, it came as external pressure a little bit. I have a a person like my mentor, he was my boss in the corporate life and we're still very good friends. And we were having a walk and talk kind of coaching session as we do regularly. Um, and he said to me, how do you, you know, now you have good traction with the market, how would you protect your intellectual property? I mean, this method, would you trademark it or so on? And I was checking trademark difficulties, too generic in the leadership to trademark anything. And I was exploring and somebody told me, write a book. It's not a bulletproof protection, but indeed it will be published, your ideas, and then you could kind of frame it. And I, I said, okay, that's a good idea, actually. So initially came as a bit of a IP protection uh, kind of activity, and it was, most, um, it was more like something I must do, not that I like to do. It was a bit of a push. But then I started my ideation process, which gives me a lot of joy and juice and, and fun. So I'm normally, I would uh, practice, and it is part of the, also the ideation process is normally, I sit morning and then I would draw in the bed, but uh, honestly speaking, more than 50% I generate while walking. So I have a piece of paper with me, I walk, I get easily inspired by nature. I'm kind of a introvert, extrovert, almost 50-50. I don't need so much to discuss with people, but I need environment to inspire me. And therefore, nature is huge inspiration for me. I have here nearby a lake and, and a little forest. And the book was on the stadium where I trained for my athletics competition. So I walk on these rounds and uh, ideas come. So um, remind me your question because I sidetracked a bit. Uh, it was uh, about what inspired you to start writing the yes. book. Yes, and the book initially came as a, as a push, but then when I started to design the book to kind of ideate what is the concept, I said it will, it will not be a typical management book, which I need to IP, just yeah. with some advice and case studies. It will be a story. Yeah. It will be a real person, not a real person, a fictitious person, but, you know, a Roman business novel who somebody will struggle. And then... When I started on this journey, I immediately get a lot of energy and like wind in my sails. And it was a German entrepreneur and there is an earthquake in the Himalayas. And then he starts mobilizing a global team because he always wanted to make international breakthrough. He was always very successful in Germany. And then he starts mobilizing a global team and struggles big time because mm -hmm. the way he manages in Germany with controlling and detailed planning is not possible in virtual teams, particularly if they're global. And then building this story building the dialogue building uh, you know the emotions of the people and himself and a big part of this person is myself through my struggles and triumphs and so on uh, and some other people that i know uh, so um, yeah came as a push but then when i felt you know this inspiration about the story and how much i could give and tell uh, i got a lot of energy and then the writing process was much much quicker and much more joyful and to get inspired about the story, you have your own like hero journey from your experience and other people you know, but do you have other like similar type of books that inspired you or you just, you know, like you didn't do any research, you just, you know, got inspired about the story and then you started writing? Yes, that was really the case. And I kind of, because I, I have so many ideas, I didn't do any research. It was probably call it arrogant or i just decided to put all my ideas and experiences and tune it in a story mm -hmm. uh, but then that's what i said i mean the the essence you have the spiritual aspect uh, of creativity something you just maybe you channel some information yeah. in the space and so on yeah. but then i realized afterwards that 
I've read a lot of books and I'm still reading books, probably not as much as I, I wish to because I do almost everything myself. I have a team for some projects which I mobilize, but if there is not particular project, I would do everything, uh, which takes up some time of, uh, for reading. But the, for example, the book um, Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Yeah. I've read it maybe 10 years ago yeah. And I've well forgotten it. Yeah. But I realized that what impressed me in the book was that it is a story. So he lays out his ideas as a story. So I'm sure that influences my decision to do, do a story. I didn't realize it at the moment when I decided and start conceptualize it, but it was in my mind. Yeah. As well as some other books, Good to Great, and some books that influenced me. Uh, they are there. And when you formulate a new idea, I'm sure you take from some sources that inspired you. Mm -hmm. or you have an emotional relationship to them and you add something can you transform so um, yes that's that's how you sometimes some people which are more systematic probably uh they would do the research they would categorize they would collect feedback and so on it wasn't my case it yeah. was putting down everything in my head and then backwards maybe acknowledging some others which contributed to that and I'm big on acknowledging and appreciating the effort and saying thank you at the right time. Um, it just, it worked differently, but then you always have a chance to kind of close the loop properly. Now, doing uh, the uniqueness of the creative process is one thing which, which I like a lot. And, and um, it, again, like uh, with your experience of writing the book, it, it illustrates just that, that you had your unique way of, mm -hmm. of approaching this, like... Um, experience of, of writing and um, the important thing is that you wrote the book the book is called remind me is it like pow it power is, team in english it's called virtual power teams virtual power the team. title is how to deliver project faster reduce costs and develop your organization for the future I, I, I started reading, I think, the first chapter, and all I can say is that, you know, like, I've read lots of management books, you know, having economic studies, and, and it I was like, um, yeah, I, I, I like this different approach, you know, more like a theatrical, you know, if, yes. you, if you wish, mm -hmm. but uh, it kept on me reading. I'll get back to it um, because I have a very messy way of reading books. I read books in parallel, mm -hmm. <laughs> four yes. or five at the same time. Like but yes, it, it, uh, congratulations. Mm. It, it's a congratulations. It's a captivating book. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we talked about basically you being inspired by walking in the nature and, and uh, maybe uh, by uh, Patrick Lencioni. And um, what else do you do like um, to get inspired, you know, like um, to, to put your mind in a relaxed mode? Oh, yes. uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's very important, um, three things I would say I do on a regular basis. If I get stuck with operational stuff, normally I try to do it in the morning because after the sleep, your mind is fresh and you are in a good state of mind to mm -hmm. kind of channel and create from scratch. But sometimes during the day, you have to do something, even uh, drafting a bigger email or um, you know, a kind of partnership proposal and so on. Um, Breathing is important. So um, normally if you get too hectic, you start breathing uh, in a shallow way. Yeah. And uh, once you do a couple of conscious deep breaths and you feel it and you just focus on the breathing, on one hand, you clear up your mind. On the other hand, you kind of get in contact with your body and then you are ready to start fresh. So I would do some conscious breathing every now and then. I do some other stuff with some more intense breathing and visualizing at the same time. Uh, but that's probably too detailed for our conversation today. Uh, the other one is dancing or moving your body. I'm, I'm big in sports. I, I love doing sports. I love uh, action. Even 2017, I, was, uh, I became a world champion for discus throw in Oakland, New Zealand. Wow. Uh, for, for sure for my age group and even five years younger that was another story they changed the program so the only way to compete was to compete with the younger guys um, but I like action so I would do 
And it's also, I've been in uh, New York uh, School of Acting, one of the famous one where Al Pacino and so on. I was just there for a day part of a, a speaker kind of trip. And they do the same. I mean, for acting, once you release the tension on your body, you release also the thoughts. So I would do like boxing with a shadow, moving fast. Mm -hmm. And then after two minutes, you kind of get to normal breathing and you're fully recharged. Or I would do dancing. I would put music and just close my eyes and dance with the rhythm. And again, two, three minutes is enough to completely come in a different state. Or now this year, I would just sing. And then if you, you cannot move much, mm -hmm. uh, ideally you sing loud. There are not other people. Uh, and I do home office. I can afford that. But even if there are other people, you could just, you know, zoom and sync on your mind and just this, the changing the frequency, you know, high and low and so on. And normally the text is inspiring. So all these three things could put me in the right inspirational mind to forget the hectic, to kind of release the tension on the muscle level, uh, on, on the voice level, on the breathing level and start fresh. Yeah that's uh, this is lovely your your approach to activating your your uh, creativity um, and it's exactly what what the um, science uh, uh, urges us to do you know mm -hmm. and and uh, you seem to be very natural at, at doing these things can you please like i would like to know you know like if you could take me through one let's say normal day of your working life you 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 told that you are an early bird and and you like your like first one and two hours in the morning when you kind of uh, visualize and, and plan the, the projects. Uh, let's start from there, you know, like, uh, do you do anything before that? Or, you know, like, like do you connect immediately when you wake up to, to the internet? And, uh, or do you just go on to connect to yourself? Yeah. No, I would try to avoid the internet uh, for the first uh, couple of hours. And normally I will wake up between four and six really more towards five actually as a as a rule so i have as a you know if i don't have to travel which i do a lot like 50 percent of my time i have time until eight to really properly start mm -hmm. and uh, uh, i would try to avoid i would try to keep before seven not to look at my whatsapp and you know the messenger which normally is for urgent kind of requests yeah. And now I deal with people. I have a partner in Australia and also a key partner in Silicon Valley. So 24 by 7, you receive some messages and they are in their peak kind of day hours. So I would, I would to be honest with you, the ideal, the optimal day, no traveling. When I wake up, I will do a little exercise. And normally it's even in the bed I would do, I would leave my for example, my uh, legs and to write the numbers between one to 10 and then reverse. Yeah. So it's, it's good to kind of mobilize and uh, refresh and these core muscles there anyway, the bigger part. So I will now start with little exercise and then I would twist here and there like two free um, stretching exercises in the bed. And it takes about 15 minutes to do it in a very relaxed way. And then I would stand up and uh, Go back to bed and take a piece of paper and maybe spend one hour time flies you know to visualize and plan and then only then i would look at uh, look scroll through my messengers and email not really responding i would if it's an urgent message i would respond but if it's a detailed response i will just say okay i'll come back to you in a couple yeah. of hours whatever um and um yeah in terms of breakfast I was more breakfast person, but more like fruits and, uh, and like fresh things. Now, since two, three weeks, I'm doing this interval fasting, so I wouldn't eat anything before lunch. I would just drink a lot of water. Oh, and it wow. saves you time, actually, and energy, because every time you eat, uh, yeah, yeah. you're a bit more, less energy in the less next hour after you've eaten, because you start digesting. Now, before noontime, I have just by water, you feel your stomach is kind of coming to your back. And yes. it, uh, it, it gives me more productivity and a, and a good feeling. And then uh, normally during the day, I would have various uh, conferences, uh, conference calls, video calls. Mm -hmm. uh, I would try to reserve the hours be between 10, if possible, 11 for to work on a project, write a blog, shoot a video, the things that are key for my uh, profession. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, and then comes this um, you know uh, calls or conferences try to be video every time possible because it's a completely different feeling if you see the facial expression and a bit of a body language and it lasts normally you know early hours is for the australians to be able to fit in a normal time beyond six which i don't like is with the silicon valley and california and so on um, and then i try to be a bit routinized um, i for example <coughs> have around 11 o'clock and around three o'clock I would do some calls because you have to do some follow-up yeah. calls you were on event people raise interest yeah. for your product so try to call people on those hours um, email again trying just twice a day to really go through the emails and respond uh, quickly but comprehensively uh, not to check it I always stop the notification function of email and try to put it when it fits me best. Um, and uh, then I have some days for more kind of creative work or marketing if I have to shoot videos, conceptualize yeah. what I'm telling in the video. Yeah. Um, even for my social media post, I try to put it in one uh, half day and then put it uh, and automate it a little bit, the posting. Um, so I have different focus, uh, something about content creation, something about delivery, including delivering keynote speeches or trainings, but also shooting some videos. Uh, I kind of neglect recently the time to research. I still kind of capture on my experiences and all the ideas that I have in mind. But uh, time is so dynamic. So I think uh, this is something that I'm trying to raise the priority a little bit. And uh, for sure, a big part of my creativity is uh, with my family and with my kids. Mm -hmm. So um, I have five daughters. Wow. <laughs> you know, you are an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> they are like 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15 years old. Everybody at home, 15 years old, uh, will go yes, to California. Yes. Yeah, like 18 months to two years, 18 months is the difference between every every two neighboring kids uh so um yeah creating co-creating with them is is beautiful and uh, this is the best time i had with um, with the kids and if in the end of the day i do recalculation it's the best time at all <laughs> because uh you move your business you know you try to do a better world and uh, over time you succeed to do a little change here and there but there the change and the feedback is immediate and you see it day by day how they develop. So, um, and there again, it was like in the corporate life initially because as a kid, my first creativity expression was drawing. I was drawing like mad <laughs> until the age of, I don't know, probably 12, but starting from like two, three years old, I was drawing hundreds and thousands of uh, sheets just with a pencil, black and white. And I was drawing mainly horses, and Indians in motion and always I would start but I never know what it is it mm -hmm. would co-create as I go how the horse is you know standing or jumping or just running is the Indians having a spear or you know a bow and so on and then it migrated again to figures but normally in action so I like this this action and I wanted to show my kids how to do it and I was trying uh, but then it was not the most effective way so now we co-decide and every time I can take the turn and every time I see what they do and maybe I contribute a little bit but then encourage it to continue on their own way so this way how we draw with the kids without a clear mm -hmm. view what it is and how we co-create it and give it a spin here and there it's a beautiful process uh, and it applies to many other um, things but I this is probably the best time of uh, and normally it's in the afternoon um yeah it's i try to routinize it a little bit but time is so dynamic this video calls you cannot do it but normally between four and six mm -hmm. uh i would spend quality time with the kids we play we dance and we draw <laughs> and then after six they may be one hour uh, calls with california and then um in terms of um, yeah then it's time to, to relax but Again, before I go to bed, not just before, around eight o'clock, I'm checking again the email. Maybe I would respond to a couple of the emails. And I do sports. Sports, normally around lunchtime, um, 12 to one, depends. But around lunch, I would do a sport 
I would order go some jogging and do some exercise with my body weight or I would go to the gym which I need for my discus and I love it a little bit of pump like once a week I would go to the gym um, or good time would be again five to six for this gym visit uh, I wouldn't go long normally I go 45 minutes weights and 15 minutes cardio mm -hmm. and that's it uh, but it allows me because I work from home and I could do any time what I do um, yes I'll try once or twice so we have gym and the rest is in between just to energize and I think that's the secret I would be too kind of bothered if I have to try to fit you know um, visit to the gym and have a schedule but every now and then I feel stuck and currently yeah. one last thing <clears throat> I set an alarm I have Alexa here, my new slave, <laughs> oh, my new partner in life. Welcome to the world of the future. <laughs> yes. So every time I sit to do some work, uh, Creative I would set Alexa, set an alarm in 25 minutes. So when the time is gone, I just stand up and move for five minutes and then I continue. And it keeps my energy also at a very good level. And I found this 25 to be the optimal interval for me. Wow, Peter. You are uh, a true inspiration of time management, focus and balance, you know, work and family and, and uh, health. Um, yeah, I'm like here, like uh, standing in awe in, in front of uh, what you share. And uh, talking about, uh, you know, like all these varied activities that you are doing, I want two last questions from the second part, and then we, we move to the third part, which actually is the shortest, but two yeah. last question. One is about the time when you wrote the book, if we go back to that time, how did you keep your focus on writing the book, considering everything else you, you, you have to do, like uh, marketing, content creation, uh, reaching out to clients, uh, family, how did you organize your time back then? It was, um, it was simple. I'm never too robust, but in this case, um, my optimal time was I start in the morning and I spend six hours writing. Mm -hmm. With this, that was, I was not aware of this 25 minutes, but every hour I would do a break and I move yeah. a little bit and energize. So I would block uh, six hours, so I'm not checking emails. Normally I would do it even offline to be yeah. better. I put just the, the, the mobile phone just for calls, mm -hmm. sometimes even on silent, but no data, no instant messengers, no email, um, not anything. And for six hours, I would write. And as I said, without criticizing, without, I would probably within two hours, I would write like 11 pages. That was one chapter of my book is like 10 to 12 pages uh without nothing and then the rest four hours so two hours just laying down all the ideas in a very fluid way mm -hmm. and then four hours correcting and maybe structuring it and moving it and so on and but before that i did the conceptualizing so i was aware of the structure of the book i was aware what happens in the story what are the key events yeah i did my preparation in terms of characters who is the character how old how he looks like what are his prominent features yeah. so this is the preparation for the novel and then comes the chapter 10 and I have six hours out of it um, <clears throat> as I said yeah two hours to lay all my ideas and four hours to correct and tune and it was sometimes it was easier for me to write the novel part because each chapter it has uh, the novel part or the story and then some advice um, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, and I was tempted, you know, to go with the novel and go with the novel. But yeah. nevertheless, I kept the discipline. This is the storyline. And then I was analyzing what happened in the story and giving some extra tips or referring to some other sources and so on. But essentially, that was the formula. It took me exactly 12 chapters. It took me probably not 12, but let's say 15 blocks of six hours to write. Wow. Uh, but spread over one year because yeah. then you have to do the other thing. So yeah. it was like, I don't know, once a, a month you have a, yes. In reality, probably wasn't once a month. It's probably twice a month, but this kind of dedicated box. Brilliant. Thank you. And the last question from this part is um, about your uh, interests, your professional interests. You, you seem to be 
person who has so many varied interests. And I remember that even you studied mathematics uh, mm -hmm. and, and then you, you moved to, to being uh, in IT, managerial role. Uh, and then you are interested in like drawing and, and, and um, what, what other professional interests do you have? Uh, you said that you don't have so much time nowadays for mm -hmm. additional research, but um, still, what is, you know, what, what is attracting your mind, <laughs> your curiosity? Mm -hmm. Right now is, is, is the music big part. Maybe that was a neglected part of my life because as I said, I spend a lot of time of drawing and now I draw every now and then and with the kids mainly. Uh, um, then uh, the, uh, the movement, it was probably a midlife crisis thing, but I was very active as a student. So I went to competitions, throwing javelin. And then uh, I didn't, never stopped, but I kind of did it very occasionally. And age 42, I decided to go to competitions again with my friends from my, <laughs> let's, we, can, we still can make it. That's a typical <laughs> midlife man kind of <laughs> response. So, and because we committed and we go and compete again. Um, so I still keep the sports and even today I'll go to the training on the stadium. I will throw discus and on the 2nd of June, there is a competition here in Northern Germany. Um, but music is the new thing and it gives me a lot of inspiration. Maybe that triggers the inspiration the quickest because the beautiful melody is something amazing. And if you start singing it and you start to hit right i'm not a good singer i'm kind of reasonable one but it gives me a lot of uh, positive vibes um what else i like beautiful uh, movies um even uh, i realize now with age sometimes when i fly long flights you can watch like four films <laughs> i do it i fly to silicon valley and uh, sometimes I even cry on, on the film. So I get touched by the beautiful um, stories and also the music all together. I think I realized if you don't listen and just watch, effect yeah. is not yeah. at all. So the sound is important. And it helps me also now as an author to see how they create the contrast, how they create these powerful emotions. So, um, and as an entrepreneur, now I have more times actually for movies. Uh, and even when I eat my lunch here, I would put maybe on Netflix <laughs> something, some of the old movies that inspired me and look with another eye. Um, what else? Um, I'm blessed with the NGOs that I work. So they let me get in touch with some ideas and mission. I work here with Youth Against AIDS in Germany. Like uh, I spoke on three of their conferences and coached the, the management team, if you can call it, because they're all volunteers and they're all very young. Yeah. Uh, that's the organization, it's a youthful organization. So I get inspired by the new generation tackling really big problems. I mean, AIDS is not as it used to be in the 90s, but it's still a serious uh, problem and you can do a lot just by prevention, by clarifying things. But now with the climate change and my daughters and how we could be more organized uh, in order to prevent the climate change. So I'm trying to be more now, not just looking in the business context, but a bit broader, yeah. you know, for the humanity. And uh, again, um, it's good that I also am privileged to have access to people who really have a lot of passion for it. And I could just help them to be a stronger team and to support each other and to leverage on each other's strengths and perhaps reach their vision faster. Yeah, um, it's, uh, I can see that you also um, have some lot of meaning actually in, in, in your work with NGOs. As a father, you, I see that you, want, you feel responsible to live a heritage, uh, good heritage. <laughs> for your daughters and I as a mother I relate a lot to that mm -hmm. and also uh, to the way you engage in, in, in music and, and uh, just to, to and watching movies to stimulate your positive your emotions yes. uh, and to even to allow yourself to be touched, mm -hmm. touched. Mm -hmm. it's really it's really beautiful um, and now I'm looking at the time and it's passing so quickly damn it and um, yeah so let's enter the the third part of, of uh, the interview which was about ideation intuition 
Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about ideation in the beginning, uh, about not, uh, you know, like uh, so being self-critical with your own work. And in addition to that, I would like to ask you um, if you have noticed, considering all these new ideas you come up with, what are the times when you are most likely, you know, to have those ideas? Mm -hmm. I think... In terms of times I mentioned, for me it's early in the morning, also rather um, late before going to sleep because the, the mind slows down a little bit. Uh, you don't allow new pressures to come. I stop my notification and my data feed mm -hmm. on my mobile. So you, and once you can uh, be preserved from external uh, stimuli, you can uh, switch on your internal creative process. But also, I think you could trigger it any time uh, if you discover what inspires you. And this is for me walking in the nature or listening to some beautiful music, maybe singing, dancing with it, and then start with a new idea. Yeah. So it's a matter of clearing up your mind, maybe hitting a bit more because the monotony, I think, and the too much routine is killing the creative process. You need to somehow stimulate unexpected changes, like with the music, you know, you go high and low when you sink or with the, you move different parts of your body when you dance and then you kind of recharge, restart it. You could start on the new challenge. And for me as well, it's not allow other disturbances. So for a while, switch off, get offline yeah. and, you know, focus on, on the topic. Or on it's amazing. I can notice, you know, like how strong self-management skill you have. It's uh, in order to nurture your creativity. Uh, when you mentioned not allowing, you know, things like the internet to, to bother you. Uh, this is something that other people can't do. And um, about, you know, very closely related to new ideas is this um, uh, thinking, which people call intuition. Mm -hmm. And in a similar way as creativity, every person has their own understanding of what intuition is. Uh, what would you say that intuition is for you? Mm -hmm. For me, intuition is the gut feeling. Without even thinking too much, you know quickly, you know what is uh, the right answer for you. Yeah. And it is a bit subjective. And as a coach, I'm having a um, personality profiler system and I'm using one system which is completely visual. It's called visual questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So you would go through questions, just which image appeals more to me. You choose this or this, mm -hmm. and then it will give you a, a full view of your personality. It's amazing how advanced is the, the brain science in this space. So it will give you this Myers-Briggs test letter, the four letters, introvert, yeah. extrovert. The other one is intuition versus thinking, yeah. N and T. Yeah. And then you have feelings uh that was thinking and details and then intuition versus feelings and then judgmental perceiving so um and there they say that intuition is something that actually you learn you train your mind it's not so much channeling from mm -hmm. external source but more something that is in your subconscious maybe you're not consciously aware but through all your experiences you build it so i believe both camps have it is something that emerges as you learn and go through life but also i think it is uh, to some extent you kind of uh, get information from outside yeah. but bottom line if you have to make a decision if you have to uh, come up with new concept if it's uh, intuition is something that you don't go through a logical process step one two three mm -hmm. analyze all the benefits all the pros and cons and have a waiting method which also there is room for such methodologies this is something that you somehow know yeah. and for me it comes normally here from you know from the guts yeah. and they prove on you know you have a lot of neurons and so on so they're not just neurons in the brain you have something here um, but I rely a lot on my intuition. In my MBTI, N is very strong mm -hmm. uh, for me, so even the science says so. Uh, and uh, because I'm a mathematician by uh, education, I kind of tend to be logical. I like to evaluate and analyze. Uh, but nevertheless, if I have to make a decision, 
uh, probably intuition will prevail in the end. If I don't have a good gut feeling, regardless what my analysis say, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing that you having a, a mathematician background, you you rely ultimately on on your intuition to make decisions. And um, the last question <laughs> that I wanted to ask you um, is um, considering everything you have experienced now as an entrepreneur, uh, what would you say that uh, is one most one thought that made you happy <laughs> the oh. yeah one thought yeah mm -hmm. since you've been an entrepreneur mm -hmm. maybe this is the quote that i'm ending uh, many of my keynotes and it goes like this if you dream alone this is just a dream if we people dream together this is the beginning of a new reality wow <laughs> And it is from, from John Lennon, uh, and it has to do with imagination and creative process. Mm -hmm. And I really believe uh, we need to nurture our own creativity. Yeah. But if we do it as a group, yeah. the multiplying effect, it could really create a new reality. Wow. Very beautiful indeed. Yeah, John Lennon was uh, quite wise and ahead of his time <laughs> with his... <laughs> his um, you know, like urging people to be imaginative and idealistic at the same time. Yes. Uh, and maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, um, because John Lennon is, if you research on internet, uh, and the other quote is from some kind of uh, spiritual leader, one of the um, archbishops or so on. So it has to do with spirituality. And maybe just a final remark, uh, born and raised in Bulgaria, I was more uh, artistically, in the communist Bulgaria, so I was, you have to rely on yourself, you know, you have to make your own way in life, and you really do it. I mean, you mentioned self-discipline, self-motivation, this is important, but as the age goes, I become more and more spiritual, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I see that many of my ideas are actually not my ideas, I kind of get it mm -hmm. from the source, and I think this quote is also if we dream together is, um, you know, the, the, the essence of our dreams have also a spiritual essence. So, yes, and even Patrick Lencioni, when I read against the, again his book, he's uh, kind of very thankful and appreciative of God, he says, for, for the guidance. So I think if we talk creativity and imagination, we should give respect to our creator and, and, and the source of all we are as well. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I totally agree with you and, um, you know, to be, uh, to be grateful for um, the divine energy that is nurturing us with creativity. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It was a very inspiring interview. Uh, we'll stay in touch and uh, now I'm going to stop the recording.